Okay, hello everybody and welcome. This is Dr. Simeon Roger from the Leader Revolution. And we are here with another in our series of videos covering Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So in this week's, we're gonna be talking about getting your top questions answered. So this is in response to a survey we sent out last week where we asked uh, people to contribute their top questions. And uh, we're gonna be answering all of them right here today. With me is Anthony Roger, who is a longtime uh, defense procurement and international relations specialist. And the two of us will be going into these questions together. So with that said, welcome. Thank you. So as we get into this, we're going to be looking first at geostrategic questions. We posed a number of geostrategic questions. The first one was, or the most popular actually, was what was Putin's objective in the first place and has it changed? Uh, and that's, that's a bit of a tricky one uh, in a sense. I think we can probably agree that Putin's initial objectives, if we look here in the north of Ukraine, was simply to come down the road from Belarus, uh, take the capital, Kiev, in a matter of not more than one to three days, effect regime change, and almost call it a day. Uh, except there, of course, there was more going on than that. There were uh, other related things there was this area over here to the east of this dotted line I'm making, which is all Russian, dominantly Russian speaking, and often referred to as Nova Russia or New Russia. And Russian incursions into that space suggest a desire to take that space as well, certainly to take uh, expand through the Donbass, which is here, but also uh, a desire to form this land bridge between Crimea and Russia itself, to form that land bridge between Russian occupied Crimea and the motherland. But then also there were clear indications of an offensive going out this way toward both Mikolaev and eventually toward Odessa with the objective presumably of cutting Ukraine off from any coastal access. So that seems to have been what it was in the in the first place. Yeah, so Putin's ultimate objectives are, of course, hotly debated. Uh, but what we do know from the map that President Lukashenko of Belarus showed everybody and probably wasn't supposed to, uh, a map showing where the campaign was going, we know that uh, at the very least, Putin wanted the capital. He wanted probably everything east of the Dnieper River. And uh, he definitely wanted all of the coastline and to connect that coastal strip to the Transnistrian region, which is a separatist region of Moldova, uh, occupied essentially by Russian forces and Russian-backed militias. Um, on the other hand, we have, it's a fair bet that he thought he could effect a decapitation of leadership in Kiev within the first few days. That's the only reasonable explanation for deploying the VDV, the Russian airborne troops to the Kiev area that early. Um, with that in mind, if he had managed to do that, he would have been in a position to, in his mind, do whatever he wanted with Ukrainian territory, which could have meant keeping the coastal strip plus everything east of the river, or it could have meant keeping the whole country, although I somehow doubt he would have done that, or it could have meant drawing a line north from Transnistria and uh, sort of leaving a very small rump state. Yeah. what You, you mentioned something very interesting there, which is the use of the VDV. 
the airborne troops, uh, which is an elite branch of the Russian military separate from the ground forces. And using the VDV to decapitate leadership is exactly what the Soviets did in Czechoslovakia in 1968. It's exactly what the Soviets did in Afghanistan in Christmas 1979. So the use of the VDV to do this is standard procedure. So when the VDV attempted to seize Hostomel Airport uh, just to the northwest of Kiev, that was clearly the, the objective. Of course, the problem was they didn't succeed and they were unable pretty much to hold Hostomel un uncontested. But I think your I think your analysis is quite right. There's there is there's a lot of evidence just from the lines of advance that the objective ideally would have been to hive off the eastern half of the country, the east of the, the Dnieper or Dnipro River. Um, what is amazing right now, when we talk about the second part of this question, has the objective changed? Well, very clearly, the, the withdrawal from the north has been both chaotic and, and massive, if we remember that essentially outside, of, well, never having taken Cherniv up here in the north, uh, essentially, all of this was uh, Russian-held territory, and yet, and and of course, so was this most of this area here, north of Kiev. Now, of course, some of that was was contested, even while it was deemed to be held by Russia, but they've withdrawn their forces and are presumably, or are said to be, redeploying them for oh, down here to the Donbas for a push presumably to take the rest of Luhansk and Donetsk, since they only had about a third of those territories uh, prior to the invasion. Uh, now we'll see where that goes. Yeah, Putin's uh, objective at this point is purely damage control. He needs uh, some sort of tangible result that he can sell to the Russian people. And soon. And soon. Uh, <laughs> Victory Day uh, is coming up very fast, traditionally a, a day for military parades, notably a huge one through Red Square. Uh, it would be very embarrassing to come up on Victory Day uh, without having had any victories to, to show for this campaign. And nothing but ignominious defeats, since Russian military incompetence has almost become a legend in the past six weeks. Yeah, much of which has been concealed from the population, but yeah. even so. Um, yeah, there there is a large concentration of uh, really the best troops of uh, the Ukrainian army in the Luhansk and Donetsk region They've been there basically since the the separatists began their their attempt to separate, and uh, now it looks very much like the the Russian objective is to surround those forces, uh, coming down from uh, the area of Izium south of Kharkiv and uh, coming up from uh, Luhansk and Donetsk. Uh, If they can accomplish that and get the land corridor from Crimea to Donetsk via Mariupol, um, they arguably, or Putin can arguably take that to his people and say, look, we've done quote unquote what we set out to accomplish, even though it, this really was not what he told the people he was going to do. Yeah. What is interesting is I find the the Russian withdrawal from the north in all of this time, in all these six weeks, it seems like forever. This is the first indication of any operational flexibility we have seen from the Kremlin. Before that, it was simply buckle down, do more of the same, take more losses, dig in, throw more people into the meat grinder. But this is the first evidence of any kind of well, I hesitate to use the word strategic thinking, that's probably do, <laughs> too complimentary, but of any mental flexibility whatsoever on the regime's part, it's pretty clear that Putin entered this with no plan B whatsoever. Uh, otherwise, he would have taken a look at the situation on the ground after the first week and said, oh, okay, time to find a way out. 
Yeah, and uh, related to that, the the Russian command structure up until now has been divided between different military districts, and they have just officially amalgamated it uh, under, I believe, the, the Southwest Military District uh, with a new commander. Uh, I am not sure that this will make a tremendous difference, but uh, at least everybody will be under the the same command structure, which is a first in this campaign. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go on to our next question, which is how strong is Russia's alliance with China and will it matter? <laughs> yeah. So the Russian and Chinese regimes have exactly two things in common. First, neither of them like the rules-based international order in which taking other people's territory is frowned upon. They both want to disrupt the international system. Second, they are both extreme kleptocratic oligarchies masquerading as something else. They support each other in these two areas of interest and give each other support and legitimacy against Western pressure. As a result, they both have an interest in creating, shall we say, alternative versions of reality, both for their own people and for the world, and as we've seen in the case of Ukraine, uh, they will parrot each other's propaganda. China was all set to parrot Russian propaganda basically from the get-go, which is uh, one of the reasons why many people believe that China knew that this was coming. Of course, the Chinese had to readjust very quickly and try to take a more neutral position when they realized the campaign was going badly and that this would expose them to Western sanctions. The thing is, outside of those uh, areas of mutual interest, China and Russia really have very little else in common. They are in competition for influence in Central Asia. You may remember the recent unrest in Kazakhstan. That was used by Moscow to assert control over a Kazakh regime that had been increasingly China-leaning and China-funded. So there is a very real competition there. And it's worth remembering also that China claims a sizable chunk of Russia's Siberian territory, uh, including the port of Vladivostok, I believe. Uh, <laughs> yes. And they have frequently reminded Russia about this. They have not dropped this claim. Uh, so these two countries do hold joint exercises but they are not and never can be military allies in the way that NATO members are. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, I, I would say, first of all, Xi Jinping, let's start at the beginning, can't afford sanctions at this point, I agree with you. Uh, one of the reasons he can't afford sanctions is because he has himself in his actions of the last two years during the pandemic caused huge damage to his own economy. <clears throat> the regime in China has done that all by itself. It hardly needs anyone else to sabotage it. Um, so China won't overtly help Russia circumvent sanctions, even if it could, and, and trying to do that, it's hard to see how it could make a difference anyway. Uh, China won't help Russia militarily, which would expose it to sanctions absolutely for sure on the same level as Russia, something the Chinese economy could not sustain. Uh, it's even more vulnerable to that than the Russian economy. And in any event, to try to figure out how they could help Russia militarily is kind of, <laughs> would be a conundrum in itself. And three, China will restrict support to what won't result in secondary sanctions. So yeah, they're happy to parrot a certain amount of Russian propaganda on a sort of low level, while on the international stage, as you said, kind of trying to play them, look, look as if they're playing the middleman, look as if they're being moderate, look as if they want to find a diplomatic solution, all of which is a cover to make sure they don't get hit with sanctions. Uh, <clears throat> and yes, this is an alliance of convenience. I agree with you. It's not deep. It's not a deeply felt connection. It's in in that vein. It is completely different from the value based uh, alliances of the West, which are deeply felt uh, and have very much come across in this conflict. So. You know, you see, you see democracies like Finland and Sweden, which are historically neutral, uh, 
raising a, a topic we never thought they'd raise, which is, should we join NATO? Uh, and increasingly looking like they probably will. So the, the West is a large alliance structure and deeply felt, whereas nothing of that sort is going on with between Russia and China. And as you said, the geostrategic interests of Russia and the PRC are not the same and they often compete. So yeah, it's <laughs> this alliance is not going to make a difference in this conflict for Putin. It's not going to save his bacon. Yeah, and just expanding on something you mentioned, yes, China is much more vulnerable to sanctions than Russia is. Yes, Russia is extremely dependent on exports largely of raw materials. However, China is not really a raw materials producer in the same way. It's dependent on other countries for petrochemicals, for fossil fuels, for food, and for just the, the manufacturing work that keeps the engine of its economy going. And it's already suffering, certainly in terms of uh, existing Western withdrawals from its manufacturing sector, uh, specifically because of the mismanagement of that sector by the current Chinese government. China is on a trajectory towards several economic brick walls of its own making. And uh, it has to acknowledge that it is not in a position to take economic risks. What I find interesting <clears throat> is that these two uh, revisionist powers oppose the current rules-based international order, yet at the same time, they're very dependent on it and they benefit directly from it. They simply want to adjust it. So it's far more in their favor and far to the, more to the detriment of, uh, of the West and of the democratic world in general. So each one is looking for advantage by readjusting the international order. In other words, but the irony is that they want to benefit from something they're not willing to, to abide by. Mm -hmm. Next question, is there any way for Putin to come out ahead <laughs> from the conflict in Ukraine? Uh, yeah, well, <clears throat> It's, it's kind of hard to see how that's going to work. Um, just looking for the pen here, but I can't even find the cursor. Oh, well. That's really odd. Just a moment. Anyway. Uh, <clears throat> it's really difficult to say, in my opinion, I don't know what you think, but I think we, we probably agree on the fact that Putin has to find something he can sell as, as victory. And he has to do that by victory day. So he has a month and counting. And uh, he's very much in the situation Khrushchev was in in the Cuban Missile Crisis. He's in a giant mess of his own making, and he has to find a way out. <clears throat> the irony is that Nikita Khrushchev, for all his erratic behavior, was rational enough, to, rational enough to know very early on that he was in over his head and he needed a way out. And he used back channels to go directly to the United States and communicate with the US government and try to arrange a way out. Putin has done nothing of the sort. He's buckled down. Uh, and it's only with this latest withdrawal or, be, you know, the beginnings of which we've seen in the last week to redeploy forces and emphasize the Donbass that we've seen any sort of flexible thinking, you know, as we said before. So if Putin can take the rest of the Donbass, for instance, or if he can convincingly take this uh, or consolidate this land bridge, which is bedeviled by the fact that Mariupol will not surrender. Uh, <clears throat> the fall of Mariupol was expected weeks ago and still hasn't happened. But whatever the case, if he can do that, then he can, you know, he has something he can take home and attempt to sell. Uh, but the consequences of this, the, the enormous losses are something that will bedevil his regime as long as it exists. And that may not be for him personally, 
uh, may or may not be very long because he has to contend with the fact that there are at least 10,000, probably more like 15,000 Russian soldiers going home in body bags. That is going to have an enormous effect. Uh, more and more of the Russian population over time will be ex exposed to the truth of what this was. So it's going to be harder for, for his regime to pull off something uh, that he can come, say he's coming out ahead with. Uh, the other thing, too, is that the ground forces have been made to look foolish. The Russian military looks completely incompetent. The ground forces, the VDV, the Air Force, they all look, they all look stupid, um, militarily incompetent. And that reputational damage won't go away. This is very much like Finland in the Winter War. For, that's at least what I think. Uh, you? I think you're right. I mean, we've heard a lot recently about... Uh... The dictator trap, the trap of authoritarian leaders who surround themselves with yes men and only get the information that they want. But the flip side of that coin is that when that authoritarian government indoctrinates its population, that population tends to believe them. And this is one of the interpretations for why Putin has not been able to accept any version of the Ukrainian peace terms, his people won't let him because he has told them that they are fighting Nazis. And if there is one thing Russians know from the Second World War, it is that you don't make peace with the Nazis. <laughs> so this indoctrination has gotten away from him and now he has to somehow turn the narrative around if he wants to get out of this with, well, frankly, any remaining scrap of credibility, especially for his ground forces. Um, as far as as far as those forces' ability to actually deliver that. Um, the short answer is they probably can't. I mean, in the Second World War, yes, the, the Soviet army was very incompetent to begin with and was completely and disastrously routed by the Germans. And then they turned that around. But the only reason they had the time they needed to turn it around was because they had lives which they could sacrifice to buy time. Russia does not have those lives, and we will get to that when we discuss manpower. Um, but this conflict has shown a lot of unflattering realities about the Russian ground forces. Uh, very poor training, abysmal leadership, the fact that they still don't have a core of non-commissioned officers who are actually empowered to know what's going on and make decisions accordingly. Their logistical organization is abysmal from the point of view of getting commanders what they need when they need it. It's very top down. They feed things in according to the order of priority set at the top. Um, they're also very rail dependent and they don't have the trucks to actually supply their, their forces when they don't have access to the rail system. They do not have access to the Ukrainian rail system for the most part. Um, all of these fundamental things take a lot of time and effort to, to remediate, which Ukraine knows because they were in pretty much the same boat in 2014. They had a post-Soviet force that they needed to transform, and they did that. <laughs> they have gone from a post-Soviet, very hierarchical, very top-down force that was not very effective to a very modern and agile force with strong fundamentals, with the result that you have two post-Soviet armies facing each other, one of which is completely ineffective because it is still following the Soviet mindset, even if it has made minor adjustments to its structure and equipment and all of that. 
And finally, I would note uh, the state of morale in the Russian ground forces is absolutely disastrous. Uh, this may or may not have uh, made its way outside of the Ukrainian theater to, to other to forces stationed elsewhere in Russia. But for anybody on the ground, I, this has been an absolutely harrowing experience and will continue to be a harrowing experience. Yeah, the one thing I'd add to that probably is the, the extremely dilapidated state of a lot of Russian equipment. <clears throat> so we saw a lot of equipment cross the border that had clearly not been well maintained. <clears throat> and because it's a kleptocratic state and this corruption exists at every level, uh, a lot of money that had been no doubt earmarked for maintenance and for buying the best tires, for instance, for, for trucks going into combat areas, things like this had gone into people's pockets. And it was, it's been quite clear that what you're looking at is simply not a well-maintained army, simply not professional. So <clears throat> finally, last geostrategic question, why did Putin misjudge the Western, that is NATO, EU, and the world response to his attack? And we probably won't spend much time on this one, but I mean, let's be fair to Putin. The West had never shown a spine before, so why now? I mean, you know, you have to give the dictator a little bit of a break. We had him conditioned one way, then we flipped on him. Um, so yeah, he, he didn't realize the extent to which his actions would provoke the West. Um, he was shocked. The West was shocked by its own response. So why shouldn't he be? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, you know, he did misjudge it, but, but there was more to it than that. I think I, be, I believe that, you know, he believed this operation would be lightning fast with few casualties. Um, uh, and if that had been the case, would he have avoided some sanctions? Well, potentially, but it's hard to say. But nevertheless, um, the reaction wouldn't have been as strong as this ongoing invasion where civilian, er er civilian areas are being pummeled, where hospitals and kindergartens are being destroyed, where we're finding evidence of atrocities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And finally, you know, and this echoes what you said about the dictator trap, dictators start to believe their own propaganda. It's an, an occupational hazard. It's a fundamental of human neurology that if you repeat the same thing over and over, strangely enough, you begin to believe it. Even if you knew at some point it was all falderall. But this, th this does happen. And uh, Putin seems to be a victim of his own propaganda, which has very much limited, I think, his, his ability to act yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so I know that uh, Hitler comparisons are overused, but in this case, there's a specific parallel we need to understand. Putin has been following Hitler's playbook of the late 1930s almost exactly without the racial garbage. He takes something to see if he can get away with it. When others placate and appease him, he gives them false hope to lull them to sleep, and then he takes something else. But much like Hitler, Putin has finally gone too far and has accidentally woken up everybody that he was trying to lull to sleep. So Putin saw Ukraine as an easy target. And on paper, you can kind of understand this from a military balance point of view. He and the FSB people that he relies on for some reason for foreign intelligence, even though it's a domestic intelligence agency, they did not realize that the equipment poor Ukrainian army had put its effort into the fundamentals while the Russian army was focused on buying new toys. And most of all, they underestimated the extent to which the Ukrainian people love their country and love the version of their country that they have had since the end of the Cold War. They have lived in what is increasingly a functional democracy and they don't want to give that up. On the other hand, <laughs> the West has a long way to go to readjust from its dependence on Russian exports, from its failed attempt to use economic progress to lead political progress. And it also needs, uh, as you said, to, or implied to, to regrow its backbone 
for example, the purely Western distinction between offensive and defensive weapons. This is a fiction come that Western leaders came up with uh, to draw a line around what they were willing to give Ukraine and say, this is okay, but there are other things that we're holding back because they're offensive weapons. The reality is that the defensive weapons are the ones owned by the country that isn't doing the invading. <laughs> uh, I think this needs to be very clear to everybody, and it's going to take the West time to break out of its habit of self-limitation and passivity in the face of unscrupulous actors. Yeah, exactly what you what you said in the sense that, yeah, defensive weapons is something you, it's a designation you impart to things you think that won't set Putin off and make him mad. Mm -hmm. uh, and it becomes ridiculous because at a certain point, you cannot placate a dictator, which is, or an unscrupulous, insincere actor. You simply can't placate such a person because they have an agenda and they will continue to drive that agenda. Uh, and you mentioned um, Russia investing in new toys. The interesting thing about this is that one of the reasons the Russian military was unprepared for this is that the toys that they've been investing in for the last few years, as you know all too well, have been largely big ticket items that had nothing to do with the ground forces or the capabilities that would have been necessary for this invasion. They've been things like strategic missile submarines and uh, surface warships and new ICBMs, things all of which are completely useless and irrelevant to this type of operation. Um, because of that, the ground forces have been actually underinvested in, in, in Russia. Oh, chronically. And uh, yes, the, the Russians have been spending the majority of their cash essentially on nukes and on new versions of nukes that are designed to scare the West and create propaganda victories. Um, <clears throat> and what the new equipment that they have bought for the ground forces, most of it actually hasn't been seen in Ukraine. I mean, the one thing we have seen are the modern air defense systems, which don't seem to be doing too well. Uh, what we haven't seen- Thinking of Pantsir? Notably, yeah. yeah. Um, What we haven't seen are the other new toys of the ground forces, uh, the T-90M. We've seen T-90As, but those are not doing any better than the T-72s. Uh, we've seen, or we haven't seen, certainly T-14. Uh, the new Armada tank. Which, is, which exists in very small numbers and is very expensive. And well, they need to keep those for the Moscow parades. Of course. <laughs> and neither have we seen any of the other new generation of vehicles that were exhibited at the same time. So essentially, really the, the new toys of the ground forces have made zero impact. Yeah. And we'll get into this kind of now because, oh, one other thing, Russia has a long history of poor <laughs> geostrategic analysis. We could spend an hour on that one, but the fact is Russia has historically been very poor at analyzing both the capabilities of adversaries and their intentions, especially their intentions. Not that the West has done a stellar job, but Russia has, suffers constantly from what you might call policy-driven analysis. Um, and this is not new, sadly. Uh, and yeah, we could get into the whole 1983 scenario of Yuri Andropov nearly destroying the world because of his insane paranoia. That's a whole other thing. Um, yeah. Okay. Onward to military technical questions. So answering your top military technical questions. Uh, oh, in the slide here, this is a, a Buk M2 system, Russian surface to air missile system. It's their, really their premier or, or most modern medium range system. And Ukraine deploys it as well. But the first question is, why has, this was the most popular question, why has the Russian Air Force been unable to establish air superiority, much less air supremacy? And why has it failed to suppress Ukrainian air defense? 
Yeah, so there's quite a lot here. Um, perhaps the most important thing is Russian pilots get very few training hours. You need a lot of training hours, first of all, to maintain proficiency in a high-end aircraft. You also need hours on top of that for each given mission <clears throat> that that aircraft is supposed to perform. And you also need coordinated exercises with the ground forces in order for that ground air integration to happen properly. And with your air defense forces so they don't whack you. Absolutely. And uh, none of these things are really happening. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, as one pilot we know said, one of veteran American pilots said that if you have only eight, eight flight hours per month, which is what Russians seem to be getting, that's barely enough to retain proficiency in landing and takeoff. Yeah. And uh, there's also the fact that the Russians have never actually done suppression of enemy air defenses. That is a specific discipline within air to ground combat. The Russians are usually the ones making the systems that other people are suppressing. <laughs> this was the case in Vietnam. This was the case with uh, Iraq both times. I. Uh, Israel and the Middle East. Yeah, the, the Russians built the SAM systems and other people blow them up. Um, <laughs> and suppression of enemy air defenses is a very complex business. There are a lot of factors that feed into it. In this case, Ukrainian mobile SAM systems make the medium and high altitude flight altitudes uh, hazardous. So the Russians tried to go for low altitude, and that's where the Stingers and the other man-portable surface-to-air missiles did a number on them. Uh, this has led to the use of a lot of long-range guided munitions, often against targets that are really a waste of those capabilities. Uh, and uh, another thing is that Russian aircraft have uh, fairly limited targeting systems by Western standards. and. Uh, Although they have various self-protection systems, jamming systems, flares, whatever, those don't seem to be being used to good effect. So that's uh, that's essentially it. The other the other thing is lack of coordination, uh, as I said, between Russian ground and air forces. It's just not happening. And troops on the ground in their intercepted phone conversations are complaining about this. We have no idea where the Air Force is going to strike next. Uh, who knows? Um, Hopefully not at us. <laughs> yeah, dealer's choice. <clears throat> well, that's it. Yeah, it's it's this poor training. Um, the inability to suppress the air defense, I find, was interesting. Since Ukraine had so much time to prepare, you know, they were not caught unawares. They had a lot of time to prepare, which meant that they, you know, they did give Russia some air defense radars to blow up at the beginning. Uh, some of the ones we saw that the Russians did blow up with anti-radiation missiles, presumably, were obsolete or obsolescent radar systems from the Soviet era. And while that may have knocked out any semblance of network integration, or may not have, um, there were a lot of SAM systems in Ukraine that survived, including S-300 long-range systems, Buk M2 middle, middle range systems, presumably Tor short range systems. And then you have all of these man pads, man portable air defense systems flooding in. Um, you know, the American Stinger, which is still very dangerous, uh, old Soviet or later Russian uh, Strela in Igla systems, which, you know, whose effectiveness may vary. And now the new British Star Streak, which is nothing short of devastating. So, yeah, the, the Russians at, at low to medium altitude now, they're, they're, they have real problems because man pads can reach up to those medium altitudes, at least in a short range envelope. So they are really, what they seem to be doing is uh, flying outside Ukrainian airspace and launching longer range cruise missiles from there, which usually demands bigger platforms like their Tu-95 Bear Bomber, the Tu-160 Blackjack, things that can carry a bunch of these things. But as you say, not always a good use of ammunition. No, and I mean, the, th the thing is, the Russian Air Force was really set up 
in its air to ground mode to counter large enemy formations in the open. The Ukrainians aren't giving them that. And if you don't have a large formation to target, if you don't have obvious fixed basing that can be targeted, obvious infrastructure that can be targeted, uh, the only way to effectively suppress ground forces from the air is to get down low and look for them. And that's exactly what the Russians have found out that they cannot do without losing a heck of a lot of aircraft. The other interesting thing is the, the apparent absence of Russian close air support. So you have close air support based around things like the, the Su-25 Frogfoot, which is their equivalent of the A-10, um, and, and attack helicopters like the Mi-24 Hind and the Ka-52. Um, but we've seen a few Frogfoots go down, but we've seen a lot of attack helicopters go down. A lot of Heinz and Black Sharks have, uh, you know, bitten the dust. Yeah, that uh, that whole arm of the Russian Air Forces, which uh, goes back really to their practice in the in the Second World War of uh, creating aircraft specifically for that niche, that is something that they were thought to have very good capability in, and yet it's fallen completely flat. It cannot survive in a modern SAM environment. <clears throat> Next question, and this was an amalgamation of two questions, but very popular uh, from those we surveyed, why are Russian main battle tanks performing so badly and being destroyed so easily? Does this mean tanks are obsolete? <laughs> now, to go into this, there are a couple things that you really need to understand first before before we even take on this question, because many people don't understand the fundamentals. So if you do, bear bear with us for just a moment. The first is tanks only care about two things. Tanks are only threatened by two things, realistically, for the most part. And this is how tanks are designed. They're designed to combat two specific threats. One is called APFSDS. APFSDS, armor piercing, fin stabilized, discarding Sabo, or just a Sable round for short. So Sable rounds like this one, and I'm not sure if I've ever successfully found my cursor again. Uh, but if I can, I will show you. <clears throat> oh, well, <clears throat> it looks like my cursor is dead, whatever the case. Um, maybe even a battery that died, whatever the case. So you, when you look at that illustration, you can see that inside that shell, aside from a whole pack of explosives, there is a dart. There's a dart and a very, very narrow dart. So what you're looking at there is, the, is what's called the long rod penetrator. And a Sable round or an APFSDS round like this one, which is the primary weapon that tanks use against other tanks, it penetrates another tank simply by velocity, by kinetic energy, pure kinetic energy. That dart is solid metal. It is usually tungsten or depleted uranium. It is designed for one thing, to achieve extreme speed and extreme kinetic energy and put that energy in a very concentrated form on the target so that it penetrates. So you develop a velocity with a modern tank gun, you develop a velocity of roughly, say, 1500 plus meters per second, or think of it as a mile per second. This is what the Americans often refer to as the silver bullet. These are the rounds that destroy other tanks. So this is one of the two things that people with tanks are most afraid of. The irony, of course, of this conflict is that although tanks are primarily designed to defend against APFSDS or do their best, the Ukrainians haven't given the Russians much chance with it because it only matters really in tank on tank engagements. And there have been very few of those. Mm -hmm. The real enemy and the one that's really killed the Russians is one other thing called usually referred to as heat, which is an acronym for high explosive anti-tank also known as a hollow charge or a shaped charge. 
a heat round, when it explodes against the armor of a tank or any surface, it forms an explosive cone, a very narrow cone of concentrated burning molten metal that basically blasts, blasts through and burns through the surface in front of it uh, with extreme, extreme force. And in order to do that, it doesn't rely on velocity. And that's why so many of these heat rounds are launched by rocket propelled projectiles. So they're a lot slower than artillery launched rounds. But it wouldn't matter even then. All you have to do is you can take a heat grenade and drop it on top of a tank and get the same effect. So it depends totally on simply the explosion of that warhead. And that warhead will create an extreme effect. It will blast right through a tank and you have uh, warheads out there. Like if we take the handheld German Panzerfaust III, the most modern um, version of that that they've given the Ukrainians, that warhead will penetrate 900 millimeters of rolled homogeneous armor. So basically 900 millimeters of steel. Think of it as a full yard, steel a yard thick. That's what it will penetrate. Um, now, modern tanks, by the way, are not, their armor is not pure steel. It's a combination of various types of materials, some metallic, some non-metallic. And the whole idea of this composite armor is to disrupt and prevent the penetration of both APFSDS and heat. The catch is if you look at a Russian tank, and this is a, a T-72, probably B-1, uh, as opposed to the slightly more modern B-3, but what you can see, you see a whole bunch of things on this tank that look like bricks. Each of those bricks is what's called explosive reactive armor, or ERA. The Russians have become very enamored with ERA, and there's a reason. The reason is the base armor package of their tanks is insufficient. It always has been. Part of that's because their tanks tend to be, um, their main battle tanks tend to be on the lighter side of main battle tanks, typically in the 40, 45 ton bracket tops. Yeah, as opposed to the 60 to 70 ton bracket of most Western main battle tanks. Yeah. So the, while the West tends to rely more on its composite armor, it's the base armor of the tank to do the job, the Russians have had to rely on explosive reactive armor. The idea of explosive reactive armor is when it's hit with a projectile, uh, the, the brick, the ERA brick is essentially two pieces of metal with explosive in the middle. So when that brick is hit, by the incoming round, it explodes, and that explosion is supposed to disrupt that incoming round and either degrade it or destroy it completely. So that's how all of this is supposed to work, <laughs> you might say. Um, the truth is, Russian ERA has not been performing well against heat rounds. Yeah, and this is due partly to the fact that the coverage, especially of their more advanced ERA packages, for some reason, is extremely partial. Um, you see here the, on the model that there are ERA bricks on the roof of the turret. Those are not always there. And a lot of anti-tank missiles are designed to attack from the top, where the, the armor <clears throat> is weakest. And some designed to have a dual warhead, so they're designed to compensate for ERA even when it's there. And I think with something like Javelin, where you have the combination of potentially the dual warhead and the velocity of literally coming down on top of the target, we haven't seen any evidence that any of this has worked for them. Yeah. There has been some evidence that Ukrainian ERA might actually work. Uh, the Russian ERA, well, it, it's a question that requires further study, right? Because all the evidence is not in, but we have definitely seen Russian ERA take a pounding and not do the job that it was intended for. <clears throat> so what this really comes down to is modern Russian tanks are completely insufficient to stand up to the type of weapons they're being subjected to by Ukraine, which is really two things, anti-tank guided missiles with heat warheads and essentially shoulder-fired unguided projectiles with heat warheads, such as the old Soviet 
you know, the famous RPG-7, other types of RPGs, some of their Western equivalents, um, such as the German Panzerfaust three, some Swedish things like Carl Gustav, etc. Yeah, the, 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 there's a whole bevy of different systems in use, and we should, I think, make make the distinction between what is useful against the armor of a main battle tank versus what will destroy pretty much anything else. And the older, the older systems like RPG-7, like Carl Gustav, like AT-4, or even the old Law Rocket, uh, those pretty much take care of anything that is not a tank. Uh, they can also take care of a tank if they get a good hit, say, onto the engine deck, or t if they take the tracks off. And so they're still useful in that way, but generally speaking, if you want to be sure of taking out a tank, you need a, a modern anti-tank guided missile and or the latest version of something like Panzerfaust. <clears throat> yeah, and of course, modern ATGMs like Javelin and Enlaw have proven absolutely devastating. Um, so that, you know, that really, to, to, to sum that up, in a sense, you could say, yes, Russian tanks are completely inadequate to this sort of battlefield. In fairness, how well Western tanks would do faced with this same threat is open to question. And they might, we might not come out smelling like a rose if we were in the same situation either. However, one thing to keep in mind is, well, you know, if you ask the question, well, what can the Russians do about this? Really, the only defense against these systems that seems to be viable at the moment or the most viable response is what's referred to as active defense systems or active protection systems. These are systems that detect the launch of an incoming round. And they, they do all of this in a microsecond. They detect the launch, track its trajectory, and then they launch a counter projectile which will explode and degrade or destroy that incoming round. Some of those are systems are good against heat rounds. Others are said to be even effective against the much faster APFS DS, although I'll believe it when I see it, but that's fine. Um, the problem is Russia, although it's, it's uh, you know, played with this stuff, as you know, for decades. Mm -hmm. Where is it? We, I mean, we know it's on, you know, new things like the T-14 and theoretically the T-90M, but those are things we haven't seen. Yeah, they have not backfitted these systems to their older tanks, even though they've uh, done substantial upgrades on a number of those tanks. Uh, and this is partly because of the expense. These systems are very expensive. They're very complicated. They're very hard to actually make reliable so that they're not, you know, set off by, you know, somebody dropping a bottle of beer from a high balcony or something. Um, <laughs> And uh, they're often very heavy as well, and they will reduce a vehicle's mobility. And they'd be hazardous to infantry anywhere near the vehicle. Absolutely, although, I've, of course, there's the argument that if there's a, an incoming anti-tank missile, the infantry are, are going to get hurt one way or the other. But, I, uh, yeah, so... The, Active defense systems at this point would be their best hope. Can they produce them quickly enough in, in enough numbers to make a difference? Uh, that's an open question, but quite honestly, I doubt it. I... You mentioned cost, which is interesting because the cost of the T-72 B3 upgrade package is said to be about a quarter million US dollars. I'm betting fitting active defense would double that. Mm, quite probably. Yeah. The other the other question that people have uh, is is you know, you know why do Russian tanks explode so spectacularly? Uh, and to show why that's the case, it's simply simply the case that these older Russian designs, whether T seventy two, well T sixty four, T seventy two, T eighty, T ninety, they all share one thing in common. They have an auto loader. So their gun is loaded automatically and there's a, the ammunition is carried in a carousel, which is right there under the turret. 
and it's for the most part exposed. This is very much unlike modern Western tanks like the American M1 Abrams, where the the ammunition is quite apart from the crew. It's in a separate compartment. It's in the turret bustle. Um, and the special precautions are taken with that ammunition so that if it is ever hit and it explodes, uh, it will explode upward out of the turret and it won't harm the crew. And this has been tested over and over. <clears throat> uh, but for the Russians, unfortunately, if the tank is penetrated, it is very likely that ammunition will be set off and that's that's what you see when you know if you ever see a russian tank in ukraine or what's left of it uh what's left of a russian tank and the turret's been blown off whether slightly dislocated or even upside down on the ground meters away it's because this ammunition was exploded by a penetration of some variety <clears throat> now to be fair to the crew um with or without that vulnerable ammunition a hit from a javelin is likely to kill the crew but and the tank would be knocked out in any case. Uh, it's just that this provides more spectacular <coughs> fireworks and it does limit crew survivability. It does. So if I could just go back to the question, does this make tanks obsolete? Uh, yeah, so this war is a major game change as far as the use and limitations of tanks are concerned. Uh, and as you said, even Western tanks would have problems in this environment, especially against top attack missiles. Uh, the Russians are making it worse for themselves by poor force employment. Uh, tanks need infantry support. They need good force protection practices to keep them safe in an anti-tank system rich environment. And they're not at all survivable in urban or even suburban environments where anti-tank missiles are in play. Uh, now, all of this doesn't mean that tanks are obsolete. Tanks have been declared obsolete many times. <laughs> Will but, it ever stop? <laughs> yeah. But in the end, there was nothing else that could do what they do. Take ground, withstand enemy fire, and deal with heavy opposition. That said... I think what this conflict has done is show that any tank without a working active defense system can end up being a very expensive to run, very vulnerable cannon transportation system. This is, the, the, what this war has done is effectively make all of the older tanks without those systems in some way obsolete. <clears throat> Yep. And that's the catch that although, you know, Russia's lost a tremendous amount of armor already, at least 500 main battle tanks from what we can see, uh, you know, they have a lot more. Their active inventory was 2,800. They deployed at least 1,300 on the Ukrainian border before the war. So they have a lot more. The problem is the more won't do any better than what's been done. The other interesting thing about ERA is that we haven't seen it on any other vehicles. We see it on the main battle tanks, where admittedly it doesn't work very well, but we don't see anything else, any effort to protect their infantry fighting vehicles. Yeah, and they love to exhibit the armor packages, the armor upgrade packages that they have developed for their infantry fighting vehicles, including ERA, including composite armor, uh, and we haven't seen any of that actually deployed. Uh, and this is a trend that we've observed for some time that the Russians love to exhibit things that they don't actually have the money to buy, largely in hopes that other countries will buy them and therefore they will have more money to invest in their own systems. Yeah. <clears throat> the next question, I love, we love this one. Russia has used a hypersonic missile. Does it matter? Bottom <laughs> line, no, it doesn't matter. So the photograph on the left, it shows the uh, the Kinjal missile, under which is a hypersonic aeroballistic missile, under a, in this case, carried on the belly of the MiG-31, especially modified MiG-31 Foxhound. And the Russians launched one Kinjal from a Foxhound against a target in Western Ukraine. Now, did it achieve hypersonic speed? Well, yes, but guess what? The Kinjal missile is simply the upper stage of the Iskander ballistic missile. And now Iskander itself, and the Russians have launched numerous Iskander and Iskander M missiles against Ukrainian targets, Iskander itself as a ballistic missile achieves hypersonic speed. So what's the big deal? 
if you strap part of a ballistic missile to the belly of an aircraft, launch it from medium to high altitude, and you cannot accelerate it to hypersonic speed, you should lose your engineering degree. But this is not true hypersonics. This is not what we mean when we talk about hypersonic technology, which is exhibited really, you know, you'll, you'll see an idea of what a true hypersonic missile would look like in that bottom right photo, right, with a scramjet. Yeah, this is, what that is, is a maneuverable glide vehicle. It's not only, it's not coming in on a, a ballistic trajectory at hypersonic speed, which is something we've been able to do for a long time. It's maintaining hypersonic speed while essentially being able to maneuver like a cruise missile. And that is much more dangerous from the perspective of air defense systems. Now that said, uh, hypersonic speed in either form really matters when a target is heavily defended, such as a warship or say a heavily defended US airbase. Uh, what it does is it reduces the reaction time of the defensive systems and it is much harder to shoot down because it is going so fast. And in some cases, as you say, is capable of maneuvering. Yeah. Against almost anything in Ukraine, these systems are sheer overkill. Uh, there is nothing in Ukraine that is densely enough defended to justify the use of a hypersonic weapon. And if you're at the receiving end, you actually don't really care too much where, how, how fast it came in. <laughs> no, you don't. I mean... <laughs> We have seen in this war, the Russians use very, very expensive weapons to put holes in apartment blocks. This is, I mean, it's not only a war crime, it's stupid. <laughs> it is wasteful of the Russian taxpayers' money. <laughs> of course, that may speak also to the fact that, as U.S. intelligence has said that on any given day, the fail failure rate of Russian precision guided munitions tends to be somewhere between 20 and 60%. So part of those failures can be launch failures. Part of them can be guidance failures. Part of them can be the failure of the detonation mechanism to actually explode. And we've seen, of course, lots of unexploded ordnance. So that as well could account for some of what we've seen by way of odd targeting choices. Mm -hmm. And also, of course, the, there are a lot of factors that are holding the Russians back in this area. I mean, that they started late into the whole serious pursuit of uh, guided weapons. Uh, there's also the corruption aspect, which probably doesn't help. But uh, those failure rates are very similar to what the West experienced with it, it with its guided weapons really up until the 1991 Gulf War. Uh, the Russians have not been in a situation where they were depending on these things on a massive scale before, and they may not have realized just how bad the problem was. Mm -hmm. Is Russia running out of critical supplies such as manpower, equipment, etc.? Uh, well, there are a few things, a few things there. Available combat troops for the ground forces are definitely running short. Um, this is, and there are various calculations, so it is, it is rather difficult to know. Uh, we know the ground forces at the beginning had an active strength of about 280,000. Of those, not more than 100,000 were actual combat troops, roughly a third. We know that 50,000 troops at least are out of action from combat in Ukraine. At least 50,000 Russian troops are killed, wounded, missing, or taken prisoner. Or deserted. Oh, I forgot that category. Yes, <laughs> deserted, yes. Um, or defected, or whichever. So a, they've lost a significant amount of the combat power they went in with. Um, they've lost, in addition to, well, we'll get into equipment numbers in a minute, but basically for the ground forces, the Russians, <clears throat> if you, you know, you have to subtract that 50,000 from the 
roughly from the 190,000 that they had positioned on the Ukrainian border. And if you do that, you realize that their combat power is significantly down. They're trying to make that up with a combination of foreign volunteers, Syrians, Chechens, um, things like this, people from minority areas within the Russian Federation. And this could be for political reasons, you know, people whose, uh, <laughs> I hate to say it, death or mutilation won't matter that much politically to the regime. But the ground forces will have trouble replacing their forces. They can't replace these people with new conscripts because new conscripts are completely useless. Even conscripts who've been in the army for a year are not terribly combat effective. We've seen that. Then there are the reserves. The reserve system is not very good. The Russians do have a good 2 million reserves, but to get those people to combat units, fill those units, turn them into cohesive fighting forces, um, none of this, new numbers will not fix their, their problems of, of doctrine and competence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, the idea of vast Russian manpower really comes from the old Soviet Union, with, which had a population of 289 million in 1991. The Russian Federation, as of 2020, had 144 million, and their population is declining, so fewer young people. Uh, the Soviet Union conscripted almost all young men into the military and maintained an active reserve system which could generate combat units either by filling out partially manned active force units or mustering new reserve units with older stored equipment or splitting existing formations in half and filling them out with reservists. This system no longer exists. The Russian Federation has a small pool of active reservists who keep up their training, but most other people are not ready to be called up and there, there is no system of officers and units that's, that's ready to receive them. So that entire pool of manpower is going to take them a while to sort out if they want to use it in any meaningful form. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the equipment losses have been relatively, you know, not to put too fine a point on it, catastrophic. If you've lost at least 500 main battle tanks, you've lost almost 2,000 infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers and over 1,000 transport vehicles. Uh, so logistics are being hit. The ability to move forces from one area to another is really being hit. Um, it's going to be interesting. They do have, they can replace this equipment still. They do have enough to replace it. But the problem is the longer they stay in here, the less viable the ground forces are. Their reputation is already shot. Can't do anything about that. But the fact is, they just won't have combat power if they stay in for another month or two. Yeah, that's true. And we have to remember that in order to make a unit combat ineffective, you don't need to kill off that unit. You only need to get maybe 10 to 20% of that unit either killed, wounded, or otherwise incapacitated. Uh, and that has been done to almost all of the units that have just been withdrawn from the north of Ukraine. So those units are going to have a very, very hard time reorganizing and making themselves combat effective once again for the campaign in the south. If they're ever, if they're even going to be viable for that in a useful time frame. Mm -hmm. Now they may be shipped there, but that doesn't mean they'll be viable. Yeah. And of course, the, the Ukrainians have been telling their people that the, the easiest way to take out a tank is to tank, take out the trucks that supply it, and especially the tanker trucks. And uh, that is one thing that the Russians don't have enough of. They never had a sufficient military truck fleet. And uh, at this point, they're, they're going to be pretty much down to bringing in civilian trucks, uh, which we've already seen. Yeah. And then there's the, the question of significant air-launched, ground-launched, sea-launched, precision-guided munitions have been used up. The, the stocks likely remain certain in, in certain categories, probably 
Long range air launched cruise missiles are assessed to have perhaps several hundred more, but for a lot of their precision guided munitions, they are gonna be running short, uh, whether those are cruise missiles, uh, like caliber cruise missiles launched from ships or whether they're Iskander ballistic missiles. Um, so things like this, they may be running short. And even if they're not running short, the problem is given their current budget constraints, given the sanctions and the fact they no longer have access to some of the imported Western technologies that re are required to build these systems, they may not be able to replace them at all. And even without sanctions, it would have taken them several years. It would have taken them several years to already to replace the losses they've already incurred in Ukraine in terms of equipment and precision guided munitions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's good to note that everybody runs out of munitions in every war. This is not new, and this is the reason why when it comes to older unguided munitions, the Russians are very well stocked because they never throw anything out. <laughs> This is why their ammunition depots blow up, <laughs> because older munitions are not stable. But <laughs> uh, yet sometimes when they're used, they don't blow up, which is the problem. Yes, <laughs> it works both ways. Mm. Uh, <laughs> so with precision guided munitions, the lead time, the costs, the, the complexity of the supply chains uh, all mean that it's very difficult to build up those stocks once you're in a war. And uh, we know for a fact that uh, Western imports were heavily integrated throughout the Russian electronic supply chain. So I wouldn't be surprised if those are going to have a major impact on their ability to replace those stocks. And Russia retains a significant number of active main battle tanks, but as we've said, losses of infantry fighting vehicles, armored personnel carriers and transport vehicles have been alarming. So if you've lost f at least 500 out of your active force of 2,800 main battle tanks, uh, and you've lost about a total of roughly at least 2,000 of your total, alleged total of 11,000 infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers, uh, and you've lost a huge number of transport vehicles, well over 1,000. That's a major hit. Replacing that is going to take years and years, if it can be done at all, under, under sanctions. Uh, <clears throat> and again, we've seen the effectiveness of these things has not been stellar by any stretch of the imagination. The question is, will, will, does Russia have, I think this is the real question, because we've seen analysts like Peter Zion say that, you know, he believes that Russia still has massive manpower. It's, it's just going to overwhelm Ukraine and take the country in six months. <laughs> And the problem with that argument, I believe, is that Russia doesn't have, in fact, enough manpower. It never did. Uh, and it simply doesn't have the combat power to go up against a determined adversary and take e and take and hold even Eastern Ukraine, let alone all of Ukraine. <clears throat> One of the significant uh, figures was that when the Soviets invaded Czechoslovakia in 1968, a country far smaller than Ukraine, they assembled 450,000 men. And yet for this, Russia was able to assemble only 190,000 and it took months to do. And it just was, uh, given the number of axes of attack that they had, it was just totally insufficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, and not only did they spread their forces too thin at the beginning, but uh, they have severely underestimated what it would take to actually hold a country or population the size of Ukraine when that population wants them gone and is willing to fight to achieve that. Uh, think of what the U.S. had to invest to control Iraq and multiply that many, many times. <laughs> Ukraine is not a desert. It has a countryside that would take vast resources to control. And it also has a much larger population than Iraq did. And a united population. 
a united population that wants you gone. <laughs> Not good. Uh, the myth that won't die is Ukraine only doing well because Russian soldiers are young conscripts who were not even told they were going to war. Uh, we won't spend much time on this one. I don't think we need to because we kind of talked about it in an earlier video. Uh, and so you see here the Russian airborne troops, the VDV with their classic blue, ber blue beret. And then in the bottom right, you see Ukrainian troops gleefully having a joyride on a captured uh, a captured BMP. Oh, I was looking for a BMD. That turns out to be a BMP. Anyway, a lot of uh, VDV vehicles like the BMD have been captured by Ukrainians. Uh, endless numbers have been knocked out. The VDVs performed very poorly. That's just the whole point. So Russia's most professional forces, the VDV and Spetsnaz, have not performed well against the Ukrainians. No, and I mean, to be fair to those troops, the certainly the airborne ones were being misused. They were being sent up against heavy Ukrainian forces, like Ukrainian forces with tanks, which their vehicles are not designed to withstand. Uh, this is a habit of <laughs> many armies historically with their airborne forces. They send them in to be sort of miracle troops and achieve great victories in situations that they are not designed to cope with. Uh, right, and the same with special operations forces in general, and the Russians have misused theirs repeatedly. They are. And, uh, of course, there are, within the Russian military, there are varying numbers of, or percentages of conscripts throughout different types of units. A more elite force will have a higher percentage of uh, professional contract soldiers. And... Uh, those, those elite units are very much engaged in this conflict. Uh, the First Guards Tank Army, the Marine Infantry, uh, they are all, they're all involved. Uh, and yeah, they, they are more professional than the, the conscript heavy units. Um, but the fact of the matter is they haven't done all that much better they're still being beaten and badly. Yeah. Yeah. So all to say that if you ever hear that the Ukrainians are only doing well because the Russian army is full of one-year conscripts who were incompetent and not told they were going to war, it's much more complex than that. The Ukrainians are actually beating Russian elite forces. This brings us to our next batch, final batch of questions, which are the top ethno-linguistic questions. <clears throat> and uh, you know, there you have a, an ethno-linguistic map of Ukraine. Um, and you can go back to this one at your leisure. We won't unpack it for you. It's fairly well known that there are a lot of Russian speakers in uh, the east and south of Ukraine. And how does that work? So the first or most popular question we had was, are there any serious cultural differences between Russia and Ukraine? Now, this is a very difficult question to answer, okay, without, without seeming to talk about things that seem rather superficial, like song, dance, and food. <laughs> and the truth is, no, I would say, as, as someone who, who speaks Russian and who's Ukrainian isn't too bad, that... The differences between the two cultures are greater than I at first believed. And I say this as an outsider coming in and looking at them and having been doing that for 40 years, basically. Uh, <clears throat> and I've certainly had a lot of exposure to both Russian and Ukraine, uh, Ukrainians as ethnic groups. I would say this, history matters. <clears throat> so significant parts of Ukraine spent centuries dominated by powers other than Moscow, other than Muscovy, that is. Notably, they were dominated by the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which at one time, by the way, stretched all the way from the Baltic to the Black Sea, or they were dominated by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So there's been a lot of Western cultural input into Ukraine that uh, <clears throat> Russia itself never really got. So that does make a big difference. And then there's a the Cossack inheritance. So the Cossacks, <clears throat> the tribes of freedom-loving, semi-militaristic horse riders uh, from the south, 
Uh, and indeed, they were tended to be freedom loving. They had democratic traditions, which Moscow eventually tried to suppress or did on several occasions. Um, but they're freedom loving, democratic and dangerous. <laughs> and that's just their reputation. And it's, you know, it's, it's unrealistic to say that all Ukrainians are descendants of Cossacks. But the, one of the important points is they see themselves that way. Their national anthem says it. The last line of, of, the, of the first verse, or every verse, we, we will show that we are indeed the descendants of the Cossack race. The Cossacks were not to be trifled with. This is something Moscow mm. learned the hard way and throughout history. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Cossacks are remembered in their later history as sort of the merciless strongmen of the Russian Empire, but that was a result of their leaders being suborned. Before that, they were the people who refused to live within the Muscovite social hierarchy. Many of them were runaway peasants, and they elected their leaders. If you want a, a sample of this, there's one Cossack you should look up, <laughs> Stepan Rozin, also known as Stanka Rozin, who once nearly succeeded in overthrowing the Russian Empire and creating a democratic Cossack society in its place. <laughs> uh, this is uh, the kind of spirit that we're dealing with in this area that has kind of been the stomping ground of various empires. Yeah, absolutely the case. It's that free love, freedom-loving spirit, which has is, is been always completely alien to, to Moscow, to Muscovy. And Muscovy being the colonel of the Tsarist Empire, Muscovy was quick to, um, you know, if we think of Novgorod, the, the Russian northern city of Novgorod the Great, Novgorod was a functioning democracy from the 12th to the 15th centuries until it was uh, crushed by, I believe, Ivan III, if I remember, of, yeah. of Muscovy. And Russia, because of this, modern Russia, the Tsarist Empire, the Soviet Union, and Putin's modern Russia, these have all been ruthlessly authoritarian societies. They have always been like this. There is not a single democratic impulse left. <laughs> mm -hmm. But there is in Ukraine, and there has been. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things about Ukraine, as we said, history matters. Most people are unaware that after the Second World War, there is a vicious struggle for independence in Western Ukraine. And this vicious armed struggle went on against the Soviet occupation force for a good five years after the war. And it consumed endless amounts of Soviet manpower. Uh, the people for, you know, the Ukrainians fighting for independence in this area, they would often target the Soviet secret police above all, the end the dreaded NKVD. And it got to the point where no one in the NKVD wanted to be posted to Western Ukraine because their life expectancy was nil. So you're dealing here with uh, really a different worldview in a way. There's more Western input to it historically. There's also the input of the, um, the very considerable Ukrainian expatriate community worldwide, uh, which also you know, has some effect. Now, along with that, you know, culture and language go together. Do Ukraine's Russian speakers support Putin? <laughs> well, you know, clearly what we've seen here is Ukraine did not fracture along linguistic lines, as Putin thought. Russian speakers are just as likely to oppose him as Ukrainians. Uh, in fact, nearly 100% of them. And most of the fighting has been within linguistically Russian-dominated areas. Uh, areas dominated by Russian speakers. It's these Russian speaking, largely Russian speaking cities that have refused to surrender. Mariupol, Kharkiv, Cherniv, Kiev. Um, the heavily Russian speaking areas of the east and south have continued to put up stiff resistance. And national unity, this is something Putin didn't count on. National unity has been growing stronger since 2014 and is probably at an all time high. Um, Vladimir Putin has done more for Ukrainian national unity than any other person in history. He's very good at that. He's also done more for Western unity than, well, anybody since at least Nikita Khrushchev, if not Stalin. Yeah, um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, Mariupol was, uh, had a reputation as the most pro-Russian city in Ukraine before the war. And now the Russians have reduced it to rubble and they're still having trouble taking control of the rubble. 
<laughs> uh, Kharkiv, of course, as you said, a majority Russian-speaking city has not been taken despite facing the brunt of some of the most professional Russian forces in the fight and being very close to the border. Uh, yeah, I mean, Russian speakers in Ukraine, despite what Putin says, are not being oppressed. They can speak their language almost anywhere and be understood, and no one will bat an eyelid. Yeah, and that's that's something we'll, we'll get to here. So the question came up in modern Ukraine, who speaks Russian, who speaks Ukrainian? Well, aside from you know looking at a map, uh, what we can say is definitely a significant percentage of the population is, is effectively bilingual, and it always has been. Uh, I mean, heck, old, old Father George Pokrovsky, who was born in Ukraine in 1907, as he put it, when he was growing up before the Russian Revolution, in central Ukraine, there were, it was a mix of Russian speaking villages, Ukrainian speaking villages. And he said, everybody spoke both. And he himself spoke both very, very, very well. Um, and as, as you said, you know, as far west as Lviv near the Polish border, Russian is readily understood. And so is Ukrainian in Kharkiv. So it really, you know, language doesn't matter much in Ukraine. And you can see all kinds of videos where people are being interviewed by about this on the street in Ukraine. And they just laugh it off as well, they know it's Putin's propaganda that Russians, Russian speakers are somehow being oppressed. Uh, the fact is, um, even most people in Kiev communicate in Russian, which is maybe astounding for some people to hear, but it's true. Um, now, there is also lots of Surzhik, a blended <laughs> language of various types. Um, now, we'll get to why this is so in a minute, but this blended language, you can have blended languages and you, you know, anywhere in the world where there are two competing languages, you'll probably have something like this. But with Russian and Ukrainian, which are fairly close, it becomes very easy to not notice that you are slipping from one to the other. I remember helping, uh, helping a Russian woman, I was translating a document she had to send to a, uh, a department, I think, of the Canadian government, if I remember correctly. And she'd written this letter in Russian, and she herself was from Moscow. However, she had spent a lot of her life in Ukraine, and she was a university-level teacher of Russian and Ukrainian language. And I went through this letter, and I realized at one point she used a Ukrainian adjective. Uh, and it was the kind of thing where the Russian adjective, I mean, it was fundamentally the same the same word, but the Russian adjective ending was in, it was Ichiskia, and the Ukrainian one is just the knee ending. And she'd use the Ukrainian one because it sounds Russian enough, if you say it quickly. <laughs> and I showed it to her and she was shocked. She just couldn't believe that she'd slipped from one to the other. It was, you know, like the, the ultimate faux pas uh, for someone at that level to not recognize when they switch. You know, both languages can be great, but you, you're supposed to know the difference. <laughs> Can Russian, and this brings us to that final, uh, I think this is the final linguistic question, can Russians and Ukrainians understand each other's languages? Um, the lexical similarity between Ukrainian and Russian is 62%. And what you have to understand is Russia, if you don't know either of these languages, if the languages you're familiar with are English, things like English, French, German, Spanish, then these two languages, Ukrainian and Russian, are more similar than any two languages you know. But they're not always similar enough. So in other words, if you haven't studied the other language, you'll easily understand some of what you hear, but be completely lost at other times, which makes it just very, very difficult until you get a handle on those, those parts of it you know, that you don't recognize so you have 62% lexical similarity, which means you have 38% dissimilarity. And it's that 38% that will nail you. So, you know, for a deeper understanding and a good deal of fun, check out the YouTube channel, Echo Linguist. So you've got uh, the channel's owner, Norbert from Poland. Uh, he really sh shows you, he shows you comparisons of languages and, um, brings on native speakers of different languages to see who understands whom. And you'll see that under, for Russians and Ukrainians to understand each other, uh, it can be done if they work at it, especially if each knows some of the other's language. 
but it can be just right on the face of it, it's going to be difficult. Other questions we had from viewers, just a very few. How concerned should other countries be a potential Russian offensive cyber operations against critical infrastructure, such as financial services, energy, water, medical facilities, etc.? I would say concerned, but I think um, the Western ability to uh, defend its cyber infrastructure has vastly increased over the past few years, partly because of Russian cyber activity, but also Chinese cyber activity, North Korean cyber activity, etc. Um, if Europe stops buying Russian gas and oil, 1 billion euros per day, will that dry up Putin's resources and end the invasion? <laughs> uh, well, it will, it would help, but, uh, yeah, I think this invasion is going to end by the exhaustion of other military resources that can't easily be replaced. Uh, if anything, the less the less fossil fuel we buy from Russian sources, the less the life expectancy of the regime. But it won't. It doesn't necessarily correlate with how long the war will last. Yeah, tend to agree with that. Would Putin use nuclear weapons? Would Putin attack NATO? Well, who knows what Vladimir Putin would do? Uh, I think ultimately, I, if I had to guess, I would say probably no. Um, although some people see Putin as increasingly unhinged, it's hard to tell what's unhinged and what's what's an act. Putin seems to benefit from, you know, almost saying to the world, I'm mad, you know, I'm mad. Who knows what I could do? Um, <clears throat> And that gives him a certain amount of, uh, you know, intimidation value. Uh, <clears throat> and the West is easily intimidated. So, but would he actually do this? Well, it wouldn't end well for him or his regime. It would be a regime ending kind of scenario. So it's un seems unlikely. Yeah, admittedly, part of Putin's MO has been a willingness to escalate beyond what people think he will do and willingness to escalate first. And this is kind this is actually kind of a a part of his sort of strongman persona. But on the other hand, uh, attacking NATO in any form at this point is uh, is just hopeless for him. He doesn't have uh, the resources left after Ukraine, frankly, to even to take the Baltic states. Uh, and if his ground forces went up against the NATO forces, given basically the quality of many of the NATO forces, they would be chewed. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't survive. Yeah. I mean, really the only, the only immediate fear that I have as far as any weapons of mass destruction is that he might be tempted to use them against Ukraine simply because it's not under NATO's nuclear shield. And if he did, I tend to think he'd tend to start with chemical weapons, but yes. But even then, the advantage he would get by doing that would be the tactical military advantages would be extremely limited, I would think. I'm not sure that it would, given the blowback that would be inevitable and the potential NATO involvement that might happen immediately, it really would seem to be just unproductive. Yeah, the cost-benefit ratio for him is just not there. Uh, and for that matter, if he were to use chemical weapons in any proximity to his own troops, he would almost certainly lose those troops. Yes, they have uh, NBC protection equipment, but... That's nuclear, biological, chemical. Have they been properly trained? Would they be able to successfully operate in that equipment, given how cramped Russian vehicles tend to be? Uh, yeah. Probably. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So that's it. We hope to have answered all the questions. Please feel free to keep them coming. Support Ukraine and relief efforts any way you can. And it has been our pleasure to be with you. 
So that's it. And we'll see you next time. Thanks.